right, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And I'd like to introduce as my guest, my good friend and pal, Norman Russell, otherwise known to his friends and family as Doogie Russell. And Doogie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. And who in Beverly does not know Doogie Russell? I would ask you. <laughs> well, you don't have to answer that question. <laughs> now, um, Doogie, uh, over his lifetime of his career and hobbies and stuff, has had many uh, different incarnations over the years, had different jobs, and uh, he's in, been involved in many different career fields and different endeavors, hobbies, and, and so forth. So we thought it would be an interesting idea, and we cooked up the idea of having a series of programs here our North Shore Journal, dedicated to Doogie, uh, called Doogie Russell Beverly's Renaissance Man. And we hope and we think that after you've watched some of these programs that you'll agree with our assessment. Does uh, that sound about right, Doogie? Uh, it sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> okay. Now, um, Doogie, uh, we're not going to get into a lot of detailed stuff today because that's what we'll do on each individual program. But what we'd like to do for our viewers today is to kind of whet your appetite with a few things here that we brought some, uh, we're going to show you some film clips and a few things we brought into the studio here that Doogie has worked on so that you can get an idea of what Beverly's Renaissance man does during his uh, spare time. So, uh, Doogie, you're, you're, you're born in Beverly, right? Born in Beverly, right across the street. And went to the Beverly school system? Went through the Beverly school system, uh, uh, joined the Air Force, and uh, did some time at uh, North Shore. Uh, North Shore Community College? Community College, yeah. Right. <clears throat> and uh, then later on, got into law enforcement. Right. And uh, I might say here that I, I have a, a long list of things that you have been uh, been involved with. And we'll just kind of to uh, to tease our audience. Uh, you've been a deputy sheriff in Essex County. Correct. You have owned and operated Russell's Auto Body, where you did body work, I guess, and mechanical work on on cars. Mm -hmm. These were the Model T's, I think. Uh, yes, they were. Yeah, the, the early model. <laughs> and uh, here's one that I, I wasn't uh, familiar with. You were a weapon specialist with the 74th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, the Flying Tigers. Is that is that the time you spent up in Greenland? Is that, that is the, correct. Okay, and, and it's not the original Flying Tigers. Otherwise, I'd be a lot older and probably pushing up daisies. But it was uh, they were reenacted in the 1950s, and that's when I joined them. Yeah. And one thing that you also uh, have been, uh, and um, you are a gardener and landscape uh, 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 architect, mm -hmm. and uh, you have actually won some awards. They have these these uh, awards for different gardens uh, that over the years. T tell us a little bit about that. Well, when I moved into the house uh, 50 years ago, uh, it was a, a total disaster. It was a dump. Uh, the guy was like a hoarder, and uh, the backyard was nothing but a blank parking lot. And uh, I took one look at it, and I told her I'd buy it before I went in the house. She, she said, you haven't seen the house yet. <laughs> I said, I don't have to. I see the backyard and what it has. I saw the brook coming through, and, and I looked at it, and I says, I can do something here. And we've done a 50-year transformation and uh, that's one of the programs I'm going to be doing yeah. on uh, the yard and garden. Right. And we have a, a, what we have actually, thank you for that segue, we have a little clip that we did uh, in the last year or so, you and I, in mm -hmm. your garden. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a transplanting hosta uh, uh, episode mm -hmm. with, a, with a fun ending here with some bees that came <laughs> in after you. So uh, we're going to show that right now to our audience. This is a little clip from the Transplanting Hosta episode in Doogie's Garden. Okay, Doogie, so what's, uh, what's going on here? What project are we working on now? We're going to do some hosta work today in the middle of July, which is taboo. Uh, they say that spring and our, uh, fall are the best times to transplant and break up your hosta. 
I have a way of breaking up hoster in the middle of the summer. Make sure you get a good shovel full of dirt with the plant. When you bring it up, that's going to make a difference when you're transplanting. Try to take as much dirt as you can with the plant. Now we just soak that in the water. Right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to dig three holes here and put in three of the hosta that we just dug up. in the ground. So what we've done, we've taken three hostas that weren't getting much sun or and too much shade because they were closed in. Dug them up, filled the barrel with a uh, wheelbarrow with water, dumped the plants in there to keep them fresh and in the shade out of the sun, brought them back here dug six, three six inch deep holes, filled it with muddy water with a high pressure hose, and then set the plants in as we dug them out. And made a pedestal for my bird estates, and I absolutely love the, the old effect that you have. Holy shit, it's a wonder I didn't get stung. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, there's Doogie planting hosta and uh, trying to stay away from the bees, huh, Doogie? <laughs> and I'm allergic to bees yeah, also, I, I didn't and know that. that, that's all it took was one little sting. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get into that story some other time. Yeah, well, now, since, uh, since we were showing that clip, we brought another exhibit here uh, before us. And one of the areas that you uh, have been successful uh, in, in, um, in doing is creating birdhouses like this one from found objects, okay? So there's nothing here that you would go to like uh, Michael's uh, hobby shop or Michael's crafts and buy. This is stuff you, like you told me, you kind of stop at junk piles and, and, and things like that. So tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about some of the materials that you use to, to make this birdhouse. Okay, thing. first of all, uh, so I could cover more bases if you are Catholic, you've got a cross on the top, and if you are Protestant, we just kind of oh, yeah, take that off. Pull. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, these are all things that I've picked up. Uh, the wood, anything you see on here, I've either picked up at someone's attic, yard sale, uh, rubbish. I'm a professional garbologist. And, for instance, this here is uh, the bell is an upside-down candle holder. I took the top off the candle holder and made a bell out of it. And the wood I pick up everywhere. I use all copper and bronze and brass fastenings so that uh, they won't rust if you put them outdoors. Most people don't put them outdoors. They buy them for collector's items. Yeah. Uh, the doors on the front here are usually open, but the for a clean out, and I'm going to turn this but the clean out is here on the bottom. And they're all initialed and numbered. I never make the same house twice. It'd be hard for you to find the same material twice, right? <laughs> That's true. Uh, but uh, the copper, for instance, uh, I think I got that at Todd Farm. That's the flea market up in uh, Rowley. Mm -hmm. And I pick a lot of stuff up there, and yard sales or whatever. I have a whole repertoire of things. I'll just I'll pick off one piece, and say, okay, we start a bird house from here, and off we go. Yeah. And I have to tell our audience that uh, I was with Doogie one time on a on a mission, 
and uh, we were going down some side street, and the guy was looked like he was throwing some trash and things out by the side of the road. And Doogie squealed on his brakes and backed up and said, "Hey, are you throwing that away?" And the guy said, "Yeah." And he said, "Well, can I have this and can I have that?" So I, I attest to the fact that these are found objects, and and uh, you find other people's trash. Like they say, one man's trash is another man's treasure, and, and you create uh, pieces of art like like this. Now. Just going on to uh, pieces of art, another area that you have been very successful at and, and uh, that I, uh, I really admire uh, is uh, your photography. And uh, I have uh, a, a photo here that you took, and I'm going to have you, I'm going to put it up here and have our camera person zoom in on it, and I'm going to have you um, describe, um, describe this photo, okay? The photo is called Trilight. It's uh, triple bolts of lightning. Two of them are hitting Baker's Island, and the, in the third uh, is striking Little Misery Island. Uh, and uh, there's a description that comes with the picture. This picture was taken May 24th, 1980, from Quincy Park in Beverly, Mass. At 10.30 p.m. during a severe thunderstorm by Norman Doogie Russell. Beverly and Salem were in a total darkness because of shorted out generator at the Salem power plant. The center lightning bolt is striking Baker's Island lighthouse and the left bolt Little Misery Island. Then I put down the time exposures and so forth. Yeah. And, uh, and what's that old thing about, all, you know, just cows stay out in the rain, don't have enough sense to come out of the rain? And here you were on a blackout walking around in the rain with lightning. <laughs> lightning <laughs> dancing everywhere. Uh, and my camera's on an aluminum tripod, and I was in bare feet. Uh, so um, I finally decided to move inside of my van and open the door. I took 12 pictures, and that was the last picture. I, I mean, I only had 12 left. That was the last picture that I got. And I was standing inside the van with the tripod. And when I saw it in my head, I jumped up. And when I got it, but I jumped high, and I caught the uh, beam going across and almost knocked myself <laughs> out inside the van. But you, you paid for that picture, huh? I, yeah. <laughs> I took it uh, to a friend, and he told me that uh, it was a one in a million. And um, since then, I've sold over 350 copies of it all over the world. Wow. And, and we will be dedicating a whole program to your photography, and yeah. I, I want to tell our viewers I've, I've, I'm I've looking forward to that because I've been hiding a lot of photography for years. Not hiding it, but I've, I'm so busy with other things, I haven't really had time to take my photography out and show people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really have some, if you don't mind me saying so, some beautiful stuff. Well, we, so you can I'm say so. That's what it. this program is about. That's why you're Beverly's Renaissance man. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you are also a mycophagist. Mm -hmm. And for our audience who are not familiar with that, a mycophagist is? A uh, person that hunts and eats wild mushrooms. Wild mushrooms, right. And um, uh, you, uh, at one time, um, uh, hunted mushrooms and provided mushrooms for a lot of the restaurants in the area. Tell us a little bit about I that. I had, uh, <clears throat> I was getting so many mushrooms that uh, I thought I'd go into a restaurant one day and see if I couldn't sell a few. And as soon as I walked in, I told the chef what I had. He says, go get them. I went and got them, and I didn't stop until I had 25 restaurants all over Essex County. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd go out and pick and go home and clean, package, and then yeah. I'd go out and sell. Yeah, and I know that you uh, you did this for, what, so several decades, right? You're, you're... I've done it 50, almost 50 years now, maybe, maybe more. Yeah, and I know we did a program with another producer here on BevCam about 10 years ago uh, on a cooking show that he did, and they he had you on as a guest. Not only do you uh, do the mushrooms, but you are a fairly good cook yourself uh, and making mushroom-based uh, uh, meals and, and dishes. Yes. Yeah, and speaking of, of collecting mushrooms, uh, I have also, to whet the appetite of our audience, a little clip of you and I out and about, uh, and I have to tell you, you dragged me into some places where I <laughs> don't think I want to go again. Uh, and this is Doogie uh, and I uh, looking and hunting for mushrooms.
This is when you want. This is what you want to look for. So what I do with these, the stems are no good, so I just cut them like that and leave the stems. Now these are at the right stage. I eat 30, 35 different kinds of wild mushrooms. Everyone has its own flavor. Uh, everyone has, uh, each one has its own texture. So we just might stumble onto something today other than the hen of the woods and the chicken of the woods and uh, find a del delectable treat. <laughs> This is the average that I've been finding this year. So this is what, about 15 pounds? 10, oh, 12, yes. 15 pounds? Oh, yeah. Oh, that one just came right up, huh? Yeah. Now, look at this. Well, let me just cut this dirt off. You can tell if a mushroom is good or not just by the feel. And this one is perfect. All white meat, everything is edible, and nice and solid. So how, that, how old is that? How long would it take some, for that something like probably, that to grow? Probably, oh, maybe two weeks, maybe less, mm -hmm. you know? So this is, you're saying this is probably at its peak, right? This is perfect, perfect. time to pick it. And uh, <laughs> I might add, uh, Doogie, to tell our audience that, that that chicken of the woods that we got that day, uh, we actually went into the Lobster Land restaurant. Hand of the Woods. Uh, Hand of the Woods, sorry. Hand, Hand of the Woods, woods. Yes. And we went to the Lobster Land restaurant uh, up in Gloucester, and you know the, the owner and the, the chef there. And he prepared a beautiful, beautiful, he had some, he had some uh, pasta and some, some special seasonings and things, and you told him exactly what to put on it. And Doogie and I, we had a glass of wine, and that was one of the most delicious meals I think I've ever had. That was, thank you for that. That was quite an experience. I, it, it was worth the crawling around on my hands and knees. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> uh, now, a, another area that you have been involved in, in for decades, really, is you are a a scuba diver, mm -hmm. uh, and you have uh, uh, have uh, uh, done your dives all over the, the North Shore, and I think you are probably the foremost expert on a, a, a wreck which is up in Gloucester uh, called the um, the U USS New Hampshire. Correct. Uh, and you, you almost discovered that, uh, but you've taken a lot of... Tell, tell us about that and, and, and some of the projects you've done on that. Uh, when I got out of the service, I, I started... Uh, diving, I saw some people diving off of uh, Endergaard College, and I said, "Wow, I got to do that. That's that looks great." And I did. I I got into it. <clears throat> There's a story that goes with that, but we'll talk about that another date. But I I was out diving one day, and someone asked me if I had ever seen a uh, dove on in New Hampshire, and I said, "No." And I asked him about it, and uh, he said, "Oh yes, it's a 74-gun battleship out here." Uh, the USS New Hampshire, it was uh, all the metal on the ship to hold the ship together was forged by Paul Revere and Sons in the early 1800s. And that's all I had to hear, that Paul Revere had something to do with the ship. And I could get bronze nails and copper spikes and so forth. So I started diving and um, then I got creative. I spotted a piece of t timber uh, one day and I noticed it was movable and uh, went home and got some help and came back and raised four ton of timber from the ship. And since then I've been making coffee tables, cribbage boards, lamps and wall pieces and desk pieces. And a um, good friend of mine, C.B. Ganey, uh, uh, helped me get started in that. I was in the auto body business at the time. Uh, it's it's something that I fell in love with, uh, I, and I still want to go back. Um, there's still some timber there that you have. Well, I don't want to. I just want to get back on the wreck and just slosh around and see if I can't find <laughs> a Paul Revere spike or something. 
I want to do it for my 80th birthday. Yeah. Well, we have we have a short clip of uh, of uh, uh, this was a dive that I accompanied you on. I didn't dive. I accompanied you on about about 10 years ago. We'll show a little bit of that, and then we're going to actually uh, segue into your workshop that you have down in, in your home, down mm -hmm. in the cellar, mm -hmm. and, and show some of, the, some of the interesting things you do down there, and show a, a cribbage board actually being, uh, being processed from, from that wood. So let's take a look at that. And uh, when the ship hit the island, it had burnt to the water line, and when she opened up, uh, when she hit the island, seams would open up, and it just rained yeah, spikes up. and nails and tunnel pins and pools of molten bronze and copper that hit the ocean water and in tow she caught fire out here again and went up against the island and went down and like since became one of the uh, most favorite shipwrecks in the North Shore. Mm -hmm. And you've uh, d uh, dove down there many many times. Are you I just about lived on it <laughs> and uh, this is quite a thrill to be back again. Can you take a back? <laughs> That doesn't work. I've done better. Here I come, baby. Okay. And once this is done and sanded, then the work comes in. Come over here, Bits. See your helper over there, Bitsy. Yeah. Let me see. There we go. Yeah. Now you see these marks right here. These are these are st stress marks, like you see mm -hmm. in, in here. Every one of those has to be ground out. Again, the depth is set, so there's one Go right down the line. These are made of bronze, solid bronze, mm -hmm. and they were forged by Paul Revere and Son back in the 1800s. And these are your pegging for the, the pegs, yeah, for the cribbage. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a piece that's quite. Uh, uh, unique because everything is from the ship for one and it was the last of the United States 74 gun battleships. What made you think of actually pulling up some of this stuff and and making things out of it? Someone asked me uh, when I first started diving have you hit the New Hampshire yet and I had no idea what they were talking about and they said well there's a 74 gun battleship out here and the nails on the ship were forged by Paul Revere. That's all I had to hear. I love bronze and copper, and I love history. And uh, I was out there the next day diving. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I really like this. Bitsy help you out all the time uh, in your workshop. There, she's probably the one, that, or he's probably the one that comes up with the uh, with the with the creative ideas. Uh, she she does most of the work. Yeah. <laughs> creative stuff. <laughs> creative stuff. And uh, we have here that you brought into the studio uh, a cribbage board, and uh, I'll I'll lift this up for our, our camera person to take a a closer look at uh, at this one, and. Um, uh, it's it's fairly hefty, mm -hmm. and um, let, let's get a wide shot of that if we could, uh, Matt. Yeah, so they can see. Yeah, so there there it is. And I'm holding that this spike is actually not uh, bolted in; it's just kind of sitting in an insert there. But uh, uh, tell us about tell us about this this spike, uh, Doogie. The ship was held together with uh, decking nails, sheeting nails, which we use as pegs there, right. uh, that held the copper sheeting on the bottom of the ship. They're solid bronze. The spikes are solid copper, and uh, the decking nails and a few other spikes are, are bronze. So these are, these are actually, again, all, all of this hardware uh, 
uh, was from Paul Revere's uh, Forge, and, and uh, so these in, are uh, actual, Canton. Yeah, these Canton, are Massachusetts. Actual, the actual nails, and um, you you did this board quite a while ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how how that, old is this? Uh, I've is this had board? that one probably forty years. Uh, yeah, and um, now do you do you play cribbage, uh, Doogie? I I do. I used to be in tournaments and so forth at the Elks, and it's a fun game. And <clears throat> when I use that board in forty years, I've never been beaten. You've never been beaten while you use that board. So I, 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 I sense that that's a trick question that you're setting me up for something. It is so kind of because <laughs> if I if I lose. If I lose the game, yeah, I just take this out like this. And... <laughs> <laughs> so that way, there I never lose. Yeah, and this now this uh, I'm going to show um, if I can hold it upside down here. So the, there's another type of nail here. If our um, if we can zero in on that, so these are a little bit larger and. This is kind of like what the what the what the uh, the cribbage board is standing, but you can see the the um, um, the pattern in 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 the wood. A lot of stress marks in it from banging up against the rocks and uh, been through two fires and so yeah. forth. You know? Yeah, that that um, that, Don't worry about particular, that. that particular that um, particular wreck has a, a quite a history, and of course. Uh, we're going to be dedicating um, uh, one of our programs at least to um, uh, to that wreck and your diving on that wreck and mm -hmm. so forth. We're going to we're going to have some footage. Uh, of course, you bring up big, huge beams of things, mm -hmm. uh, and they're not they're not already this this size. So, and I know you have a, a place where you go to to get the. Uh, uh, get the wood timbers cut the down. timbers cut down to the to, to a workable size for you and then you do the you do the final finishing in your um, uh, in your workshop in, in at home yeah, so right. um, well doogie I, I have to say that uh, I am looking forward to our tapings uh, and we haven't even we haven't even talked about some of the other stuff you know you're a, you're a boater and you're a comedian and an entertainer and you are a storyteller believe me I've, I've heard a lot of your stories <laughs> Um, and you've lectured, and I know that you have uh, consulted with Beverly Hospital and the Boston Poison Center mm -hmm. and the Rhode Island Poison Center. How did you become a poison? Is this for mushroom poisoning? Yes. Or, oh, okay, yeah. so poisonous mushrooms, yeah. Uh -huh. And and here's one that I actually, I've known you for, what, 12 or 15 mm -hmm. years, and this is one that I just found out, the, uh, I think one of the last times we were together here in the last few months, both you and your wife were state archery champions that's correct and uh, <laughs> now, do you still do you still uh, do any, sure, any no, archery? No? I couldn't pull a bow if I had to today but uh, that was that was uh, that was a lot of fun um, it just got to a point where we did it seven days a week and we we're always going to tournaments and so forth yeah um, but uh, just another little thing that another I picked up thing. and dove into well uh, I want to I want to thank you Doogie and I, I again I want to invite our viewers where you're going to be dedicating uh, and I got a feeling that we're never going to run out of fodder I don't think we're going to run out of stories program. and we're going to we're going to tape a, a show as often as we can uh, we hope we've whetted your appetite a little bit and um, I think I will be along with our viewers I think I'll be finding out things about you that I still don't <laughs> don't know Mr. Doogie Russell <laughs> Beverly's Renaissance man. Thank you, Doogie. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And I'll uh, remind our viewers that you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.